Hi, I'm Heather Dakota. I'm the managing editor of the GROW Network, and we're here today at the Resilience Garden at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And Bettina Sandoval's gonna show us some Pueblo gardening techniques. So let's get going. So the Resilience Garden uh, here at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center is all about the history of Pueblo agriculture. Um, it tells a story from pre-contact foods through traditional farming methods um, all the way to modern vegetables and um, also gardening methods too in, in urban communities. Zuni in particular is highlighted with the waffle gardens because that's where um, they came from, is from Zuni Pueblo. We have um, different varieties, you know, over the years we choose to plant different things, uh, but we usually try to focus on the three sisters, which is the corn, squash, and beans. Um, and then in our pre-contact area, we have a lot of um, berries and different types of shrubs. Um, the fruit trees here, are the ones that um, represent the Spanish contact and everything. Pre-contact plants that were grown, um, here what we represent is mainly the berries and you know some different shrubs, some different types of herbs like mint, um, cotton. Um, we also have like strawberries, raspberries, you know those are those are native here now, <laughs> you know they grow here. <laughs> um, but as far as any really traditional herbs, um, we leave them where they naturally grow. So uh, I'm from Taos Pueblo, so that's um, where I get a lot of, you know, all of my knowledge comes from Taos Pueblo, and it's, it's a different climate. So the herbs that grow naturally there um, are things like wild spinach, um, which is used for a lot of different things. Um, yucca is also a a main tool for the Pueblos. It can make so many different things. Um, the, there's wild celery, there's um, tea. It's a, it's a tall grass that grows and we collect that and you can boil it and that's our tea. And we still collect it and boil it and we don't cultivate it. Um, we leave it wherever it naturally grows. Things like choke cherries, um, of course, you know, different plums that are native to um, kind of mountainous areas. And then, uh, I mean, there's, there's a whole variety of things that I don't know the, the, the name for in English. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's, but there's a lot. There's a lot of plants that grow here naturally in, you know, the mountainous areas. Um, mushrooms, there's wild mushrooms everywhere up in Taos. Um, you know, things like that. So uh, the Zuni Waffle Gardens are, um, they, they pretty much started when, um, you know, the, there, were no, um, there was no permanent water, and so they heavily relied on rainwater. And um, it basically operates like a, like a puddle, you know, in, in a dented area will fill up with water no matter what. So whenever there's heavy rains, the waffle gardens, you know, naturally fill up with the rainwater. Um, but also with no permanent water, you can't, um, you can't water a large area of crops. So they were having to hand water. And in order to keep the water in uh, concentrated areas around the roots, um, the best idea was to build you know, walls around the plant. And that's where the water would be concentrated because they could fill up that little square you know, with a large pot, they could fill up, you know, two or three. And, you know, yeah, it's, you know, it's a, a lot of labor going back and forth, but um, it's wasted labor if they're just pouring it on their plants. And then sometimes the water runs down or, you know, it's not concentrated. So that's kind of, you know, where, where it pretty much um, came from, from, you know, our perspective today. Um, and when Pueblos were established, it was, anywhere from you know, 900 to 1300 AD. So um, you know, in that time frame is when Pueblos were 
um, established along the Rio Grande. And, you know, of course, Zuni is not along the Rio okay. Grande, but <laughs> um, they were also established during that time. So it's ma mainly seasonal rains that, okay. yeah, that they relied on. Um, there is evidence of, like, rivers and stuff that were out at um, Acoma Laguna and um, Zuni. So they had seasonal rivers <laughs> also okay. right. during the summer. Um, so down here in the southern area, um, there's a lot of plateaus and, you know, kind of little, you know, hills and stuff like that. Um, so if you look at it, um, most of them are rock, right? So the water doesn't soak into them, it runs off of them. And so um, what was done is they would find, you know, which side of the plateau does the water come down the most? And that's where they would put their gardens because the water would just flood into their gardens, you know. Um, and then the walls came along, you know, there's a barrier all around the flooding um, gardens and um, they would just let the water come in and fill it up. And then sometimes they would have, you know, multiple flooding areas. So the water would fill up one area and then they would, you know, take down the wall and then it would fill up the next area and then the next area, you know, depending on how much water there was. The waffle gardens were mostly for like um, melons and squash. Um, and then the flood uh, areas are mostly for that as well. Because when you have a lot of water um, coming into your corn, it's, um, it creates a hazard for the stock because it could fall over. Right. So we don't usually use flood water like that, you know, because it'll, it'll take away the, the bottom, you know, the dirt. Okay. So the corn stock could fall over. It was mostly communal plots. So there wasn't just one area that you could plant. You know, you didn't own land um, back then. <laughs> and so um, most of the gardening was just done on a community basis and um, rotating crops, you know, was done here and there. But there were so many places that you could plant that, you know, you just move your garden every year. And then by the time you get back to you know, wherever it was that had time to reset, you know. Rest. Yeah. And I think that was learned, you know, through um, our various migration paths. You know, there's Mesa Verde, there's um, Bandelier, uh, areas like that up in the north and northern area. And so um, I think that's where, you know, we like learned our lessons, I guess, you know. Um, there were huge populations at those areas. And after a while, you know, I mean, Mesa Verde are cliffs and mesas, you know, so how do you um, have so many different spots to grow your plants? You know, you really don't. So supporting huge populations like that would be very difficult with limited space. <laughs> corn, uh, corn came from Mexico and, um, you know, it's, there's various dates that, you know, come about, but um, we've had corn for thousands and thousands of years here in the southern area. Places like Mesa Verde, the oldest areas are where um, we really learned how to grow corn. And, you know, beans and squash are kind of, I mean, I've looked up the history, I've looked up different things, and there's just like 10 different dates. So I'm not gonna choose one and say that's, you know, where it came from, but um, yeah, there's, it's, there's no knowing really where uh, different plants come from, unless it has, you know, a nice um, story of, you know exactly where it came from but um, <clears throat> so you know those are the types of things that we have in our history that where we learned it and and why we do what we do today when Spain came through you know they we were we were thriving you know um, we had seven years of food storage and so they're like well we're not gonna mess with that <laughs> <laughs> you know, they have food. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we pretty much helped them survive. And, you know, really without us, they wouldn't have survived with um, what they had um, because they weren't used to the area. They didn't know, you know, where to plant. They didn't know what kind of predators were here. You know, they, it was, you know, all new territory <laughs> um, for them. They were in Mexico for quite a while before um, they actually came up here. So I think, um, it was mostly, um, you know, if they brought anything, it was from Mexico, I think. Okay. Um, but, I mean, of course, they brought, you know, the sheep, the horses, the chickens, you know, all that kind of stuff, the fruit trees. 
um, that we have here. So um, yeah, so they, of course they did bring seeds. Um, so it, it added to, you know, uh, what we already did, but I don't think it changed it. So there are various ceremonies that we do in public communities, and some of them are around agriculture. Um, it's, you know, of course, the season starts in the spring, so that's when most of them would take place. Um, it depends on which Pueblo you're at, <laughs> um, for what kind of, you know, uh, what kind of ceremonies or what kind of things are done for the growing season. Um, but there's a lot of dances, you know, there's, um, like in Taos, we have dances on May 3rd every year, same day, and it's mostly for, you know, prepping the soil, getting, getting things ready. It's kind of the signifier for um, people to start preparing for the growing season. Um, and it's also, you know, just to bless the, the land, you know, bless the area, um, the songs, the, the dances and everything are um, specifically for that. And then throughout the summer, we have different dances, like, like corn dances mainly throughout the summer, um, which are just to, to bless the fields and, you know, hope for a good harvest. And um, there's southern pueblos down here that have butterfly dances, um, which, you know, butterflies are pollinators. And so they're very important to the story as well. Um, but outside of that, you know, there's a lot of other things that go on that um, we can't share about. but. Most of the Pueblos still have their agriculture. Um, there's a lot of families, uh, individual families who practice, you know, who, who grow every year. Um, there's some that take breaks, you know, here and there. But um, for the most part, I think that it's really um, getting stronger. Uh, a lot of, you know, younger people are inheriting land now. And so um, they're really starting to grow crops even if you know they don't know a lot about it or you know it's just um it's kind of becoming popular again I guess too um so you know there's a lot of interest in our resilience garden what we're doing here is really just um trying to inspire I guess um you know there's these these methods are created through um you know thousands of years of trial and error <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it's still what people come up with at the end anyways, you know. Uh, I mean, if you just got out there and started growing something, um, you would learn these methods anyway, <laughs> you know, for the most part, because it's, it's really just, um, you know, it's really common sense for, for gardeners, um, the, things that, the things that you learn over the years. So I guess, it, you know, it would be easier <laughs> to learn some of the best, you know, methods right away. Um, but you still have to adapt it to where you are specifically, um, especially with the soil. I mean, there's so many areas, um, especially in urban areas, where you can't choose where to have your garden <laughs> and you can't change it, you know, unless you buy different plots of land, which is not possible for a lot of people. Um, so learning how to amend your soil correctly is really important. Um, also composting, you know, that's the best way to, to amend your soil and to, you know, be sustainable. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, just sharing, you know, sharing knowledge with other people, getting, getting a little community together of gardeners, and, you know, that's kind of how things um, move forward and thrive. One of the main things about the Resilience Garden is uh, its name. Resilience is a common theme for the Pueblos throughout history. All the different nations that we've survived through and also that the fact that our agricultural practices and our seeds are still alive is pretty incredible to me anyways. Um, so I think, you know, naming it the Resilience Garden was, um, was really, you know, powerful and I think um, inspiring for me and for, you know, other people who discover it, I feel like. Um, we also have a little seed bank um, and people come and drop off seeds here and there that they just want us to have them and you know they're different Pueblo seeds that their family has had and it's like better than money <laughs> you know like uh, yeah <laughs> um, but there's also various projects that people want to do here because they hear about the resilience garden and what it stands for what it means and um, you know the the area um, over here is is one of those projects that came of it and um, it's you know, water harvesting, sustainability, there's a bee hotel um, that students all, um, like 10 students, did all of this work. Um, and so it's, you know, 
it's a pretty amazing project and it really helped us out with you know making it more homey here and making it look nicer and um, also helping us to use the water that's you know falling and and um, our tanks we have two harvesting tanks and so um, that was one of the <clears throat> big projects this year that I'm really proud of and um, really thankful for <laughs> um, so come on down and check it out <laughs>